Tell the viewer what you did to me at sports day one year. Oh yes, that was great. This is the dad's race, it's 100 meters and they were all like doing groin stretches. And, and I think we looked at each other thinking, we're not gonna win, <laughs> we can't run. How can we steal this moment and make it about us? When they tear off, I grabbed you and then you grabbed me. By the time the, the race was over, we were still fighting. We were actually even wrestling. <laughs> yes. At one point, I think we were on the floor wrestling. Yes. Yes. And it became a show. It was, I was thinking, this is, is anyone filming this? This is gold. I remember thinking, this is great. All right. Okay, okay. Uh, here we go. And then, Mr. Relaxed. Good. Today's guest, it's an old friend. They're not all old friends. I mean, I can, I can make new friends. Omid Jalili. It, just a lovely man, funny man. Anyway, let's see. Let's see if Omid Jalili is waiting, like Aretha Franklin did for, for George. Hello, hello. I can't... <laughs> I can see him. I can see him, but I can't hear him. So it's probably best. Look at you. What, have you just, just had a workout or something, or, or, or have you given up? I gave up about 25 years ago. No. I think we went to the Riverside Club together, and that was probably the last time I went, about 22 years ago. This is a health club, because Omid and I used to live near each other. Kids went to the same school, more of that later. But what, did we go, what, did we play tennis or something? No, we just went for the, I think we went um, and sat by the pool. <laughs> That's what it, it, was, it, was, it was gossip time with Rob Brydon. That's all I remember. In those days, I mean, I've become a very accomplished swimmer. I'm sure you saw my film, Swimming With Men. You don't need to reply. You've always been very fit. You look great, by the way. Oh, thank You've you. You've obviously gone the other way. You're training. I, I've, gone, I've gone up to three times a week. Doing what? With, with <laughs> the tra training. I yes. take my laptop into the garden and I put it on the little children's playhouse thing and I've hung a bag there and stuff and I, and I do exercises and she, she's at the other end and I feel good. The bigger picture of what you're asking is, did you see this time as a hiatus? And I think I initially did. Yeah, initially, and now, and, and now it, and now it's, now it's, mm, yeah, I got to earn some money. I started videoing things done a couple of these as well, which have been very fun. I did one with Rain Wilson recently, and I asked him, who are your favorite comedians? And he said his favorite show is The Trip. He said that he, he just absolutely, you know Rain Wilson who plays Dwight Schrute yeah. in The American? Yeah. He's a huge fan of you guys, and binge watches it. And uh, so it's good, to, it's good to be in contact. You're actually spending time with people that we haven't, I mean, I haven't seen you for a long no. time. And when, when you asked me to do this, I thought I get to spend some time with Rob. Yeah. So I think that, We've, we've, got, we've got to have that mentality that we, we can socialise, we can be with our friends, but it's just a slightly different way. I still get a real thrill when I hear that an American knows my stuff or likes my stuff. I was uh, in contact with, do you know Amy Poehler, uh, who was on... Uh... No, but again, she's another one. She said she liked human remains, and, I, and that's a great example. I read that in a paper, and I was, like, walking around with my chest puffed out all day. It's huge. I was in contact with her agent and my iPhone changed her name to Amy Pornhub. So she got very, very offended. And I don't know how to fix my phone. Well, you, you, know, you know that predictive text will sometimes just go to a word that it's being asked to type a lot anyway. <laughs> okay, so here, here's the thing. Here's the thing I want to bring up with you. Do you recognize, do you recognize this? Is, is, that a, is that a very small carpet that you were sold? Are you angry with some, some Arab who sold you that for about £1,000? And so I'm going to bring it up with you because you very much are a spokesman for anything Eastern. No, you don't, you don't recognise this? No, I do. I think I, I, I got you that for your, for your uh, 50th birthday. Yeah, that's, that's my birthday present to you, yes. And, and listen, and I love it, right? Because this is, this is how I see myself. But let me be very honest with you. I've never worn it outside the house. I, I don't have the <laughs> I don't have the confidence. But but I've seen you wearing them and they look great. It just gives you a little bit of kind of classy panache. And I, I felt that you were lacking that. <laughs> and I felt that you should you should use it, but I'm very disappointed you don't wear it. So it's not a cravat then. It is a, I mean for me this is a, this is a tent. 
I, I, I could camp, I could survive in the wild in this. You can wear it as a cravat. Yeah, if you just roll it up and then put it around your neck. That, that's it, leave it inside, perfect. Honestly, I think we should do a, a version of the Persuaders. You know, you, you can be the Roger Moore, I'll do the Tony Curtis. Oh. We've never, let me take it off, just, just for continuity, Omid, you understand. <laughs> We've never properly sort of acted together, but we go back a long way. When did, when did we meet? I think we met in 1998 outside East Sheen Primary School. I think you, you were trying to get me to do a radio show at the time, which you were doing. And then um, I think I, I never got back to you. And then years later, when I became such a huge fan of yours, you kept reminding me, yeah, you wouldn't do my radio show, my little radio show, because I wasn't big enough. I wasn't in your radar, Mr. Jalili. Um, but now, after Human Remains, you can't stop texting me. You keep asking me about Julia Davis. I think you, it, it, was, it was stuck in your craw that I didn't do your radio show. I have, no mem I have no memory of that. No memory of that. Really? Oh, my goodness. Please, we tell, me, please tell me you have these Ooh. things as well, where people will say something to you like that, and you have literally no memory of it. Yes, I remember. I spoke to Michael McIntyre about this because uh, Michael McIntyre has no memory of him when he was a 25-year-old TV producer on a show with Max Bygraves. It's just a five-minute pre-Christmas show. Max Bygraves will give you a present and you give him a present. It'd be really funny if we, we present you as a kind of Arab prince. So I said, oh, fine. I said, hello, Mr. Max Bygraves. You are the greatest thing in the whole of Saudi Arabia. We love you. And here's a present for you. And then he said it was fantastic. And then afterwards he said, by the way, my name is Michael McIntyre. I've done eight gigs. I've stormed them all. I want to be a stand-up comedian. Do you have any advice? And I said, always have self-belief. Have belief in yourself and that will carry you through. And he said, oh no, I've got, I've got lots of, I've got lots of self-belief. Have you got any other advice like that? Which I thought was really funny. And he has no memory of that as well. Now the Michael thing is interesting because I knew Michael, you know, years ago. I, I saw Michael uh, in Edinburgh playing in a little upstairs room that maybe held 40 people and it wasn't full. And, and, and then what he had was, he had that self-belief because he, he was doing all this riffing with the audience and, and it was good. It wasn't great, but, but it was good. And I remember thinking that he didn't really have much material. And I always think with Michael, it's like, um, like one of the Rocky films, you know, when, when he goes into the training montage and he gets stronger and the calendar starts flying by. Because I can remember then, then he would start to pop up on television on different like the Jack D, Apollo show, things like that. And each time he was a little bit stronger and a little bit stronger. And you'd look at him and you go, wow, yeah. And he was really connecting with the audience. It, th that was quite an interesting thing. But the self-belief is a very interesting point because you and I were on the circuit at the same point in the sort of late, mid to late 90s. There were comedians then who would take the roof off, but they've not gone on to do so well. Why? A lot of comics with a, lo a lot of, I suppose, principles <laughs> who don't like to be told what to do by... T like, I'd have a TV person and I'd do really well. And then the TV person said, well, well, we'd love you to do this, but drop that, drop that. And I'd, I'd be thinking, well, that's my best bits, but fine whatever whatever you want and I think it might be a mentality of people who either compromise or don't compromise now I'm not saying that I was always compromising but I do think that the, the comedians who do very very well uh, uh, also don't feel they need to adapt for television because yeah. I, remember, I, remember, I remember seeing John Bishop for example and I remember thinking really clearly, he's great, but he's never going to make it on TV because he swears so much. He was one of the sweariest comedians. And then I think that when I saw him on television, I said to him, wow, you made it on TV? He goes, yeah, my, my wife just said I swear too much. And one of the TV people said, cut the swearing. So he did. He cut the swearing. A lot of people won't do that. A lot of people yeah. think it's part of what they do. So I think it's a, it's a question of what are you prepared to compromise? Well, I, I see that a lot. I see a really good act. And they're swearing. Now, do you, do you, you don't swear in your, in your stand-up, or, or do you? I don't think of you as someone who does. 
I don't know, not really. Again, I've, 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 as the older I get, I think it was a question of my children coming to see me. And um, and it, it, it really is interesting. They, they saw me once, and I think live, and they didn't like a couple of things. They liked most of it, but they literally said it's like having a meal and there's just a speck of excrement in the show. <laughs> would, you, would you eat the meal? And I said, oh, if there was a speck, wouldn't you just remove it? He said, no, I probably wouldn't touch the meal. So they were very um, sharp and strong with me. They said, they, they made me question. And these kids were, there was when they were 14 or 15. Yeah, yeah. They just were very adamant that if it's if it's not good enough for us, yeah, and you take it out, well, why don't you just take it out for the audience? So it made me question a, little, a bit more. Um, now, I want to talk to you about this, the drive-in comedy, which yes. fills me with terror how is that going to work can it work it does fill me with dread because the area where they put 300 cars is huge i mean it's like it'll be as wide and as long as maybe the o2 i'm going there tonight to have a look i think dom jolly's on tonight and daniel sloss so i'm going to go and watch to see how they deal with it because you know you want well, you know, I, I want i want my audience really crammed close together and ideally i want them to be uncomfortable I, I don't even like it when the seats are seriously are comfortable and spacious uh there's um i, I played the harrogate international center you played there and that that's like i mean the seat is a night out in itself and and i i so so for me the thought of them i can't wait to hear what it's like because i don't i mean the thing is i think if you've got strong material you'll be fine. And that's where I fall down. <laughs> what was that fantastic um, director's commentary thing you did? What, what, what was that called? That was called, it was called director's commentary and his name was Peter Delane and he spoke like that. He said, because I, when I've always directed on my instincts. And of course, I've always had very bad instincts. No, you've even done your, you've done your own material wrong. Why? You've done your own, I can do your material better than you. Go on then. Because I, I'm a director and, and I, I never read the book, I never read the script. I, I rely, I rely totally on my instincts and, uh, and my instincts are very bad. Very bad. <laughs> now, I, here's what I want to talk to you about. And I want to praise you. Right. Mamma Mia 2, what you do in Mamma Mia 2 is joyous, yes? You just broke up. You just broke up. What you did in Mamma Mia 2 is something. I didn't hear what the word was. I said it's terrible. No, I said, I said what you do in Mamma Mia 2. I just loved it. Tell me about the Mamma Mia 2 experience. Well, I mean, the reason I came onto their uh, radar is because I had a bit of stand-up about it. That The first film, the ABBA songs were so powerful. They're now using ABBA songs in fresh remakes, like they're doing Goldfinger. And I've seen the script and you've got basically Bond strapped down and there's a laser coming between his legs. And he says, do you expect me to die? They said, no, Mr. Bond, I... <laughs> let me, Ahmed, Ahmed let, let me help you out with your material here. He strapped <laughs> the, laser, dead, the laser, the laser, the laser is coming. He says, do you expect me to talk? He says, no, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. And Bond goes, if you change your mind. <laughs> I had the first thing in line. So, so they thought it would be fun to have me in the film. So, and I said, what, what is the part? And they said, we don't know. We just want you to be there as the guy who stamps the passport. I don't know if you know him, the director. He's Thandie Newton's husband and he's a very sweet guy. I kept saying to him, can he be in love with Colin Firth? <laughs> so, so when Colin Firth shows up, I say he's he's like he's like the fine wine and fine cheese and all that. So it was all um, sold to me as a holiday because you'll get X amount of money. Just come and play with us for a yeah. week. I went to the premiere not expecting anything, but my goodness, three thousand five hundred people there. Yeah, Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson were sat behind me, screaming and going bananas. I didn't, of course, they're the executive producers. So they're screaming, the crowd, the crowd are dancing when Dancing Queen is on. They're all in floods of tears when Meryl Streep comes back. It was like the most extraordinary uh, premiere I've ever seen. People were going nuts and they were all told to sit and wait for the post credits. I arrive in the post credits. Yeah. And then after they did that, everyone rushed around me like as if I'm the star of the movie. So all they did was darken my beard. That was meant to be 30 years before. And then they had my beard as it is now. 
because they kept saying, you've got such wonderful skin. They, <laughs> it was the, that was the best thing was getting compliments that my skin apparently is like a 25 year old man and they didn't have to touch my skin. They just changed my beard. So I'm, 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 that's the thing I'm, I'm most happy about. <laughs> but to what, to what extent, when, when you do a thing like that, I found myself in a situation like that when I'm acting with these big names. It, I can be intimidated by that. Are you at all intimidated or do you feel creatively free? Well, that, that's the thing. I, I think that when, when you're with people who are, I suppose, very high level, they always make you feel great. I'll never forget that when I first met Robert Redford, he was so kind and nice and made me feel like a million dollars. I probably bored the hell out of him saying, well, Robert, th this is about my life. But this, and I, I think I spoke for about half an hour. You tell me the story again you told me about when you met him and the, you did a gag uh, at his expense and then he came right back at you. Do you remember that? So uh, when I was introduced to him, um, he, uh, he, he said, hi, I'm Robert. Very nice to meet you. And I said, uh, I am Omid and I'm a big fan of yours. You are the best thing in Hawaii Five O. I I watch it all the time. And I'm, uh, whenever I'm in a dinghy boat going da 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 I always think of you. And he just looked me up and down and said, thank you, uh, you were great in Dr. Zhivago, but you've let yourself go. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was a very quick, and I just thought, wow, this guy's bloody funny. You've done a, a fair bit of time in musicals. I didn't realize how much I, I knew you'd done, Oliver, and I knew you'd done Fiddler on the Roof. When you commit to a musical, that's hard work. Yes. That is, that's really hard work. And I think the difficulty with doing that, there is a certain machinery that goes with it. And if you do anything that's outside of that box, they do get upset. I did some things in the, in the first half and I think they were, there's, there's show reports. Yeah. There were art <laughs> the show. Yeah. And sometimes I'd come into my dressing room and Cameron McIntosh is there almost with a cat, you know, like Blofeld. The point was he would hear about things. I think that I kept saying, in the middle of the musical, there's a bit where they, in the middle of Pick a Pocket, they pull out the kids, pull out Fagin's underwear. And you have this stained underwear and they go, poor Fagin, they stink. And all Fagin goes, he goes, you've got to pick a pocket or two. And the song continues and there is no mention. You've, how did you get my pants out? So what, I couldn't help it. One night, I just, I just came out. They pull out my underwear. They go, poor Fagin, they stink. And I said, and so would you if you spent six months next to my bollocks. And of course, it got a massive laugh. And of course, and I knew, I wonder where he is. I came in my room and he goes, what on earth do you think you're doing? I got a text 15 minutes ago and I, and I was in marble arch. Listen, we're, we're almost out of time. It's been, it's been really lovely, if, as much as anything else, just to catch up with you. Let's get together with a perspex screen between us and have a lovely lunch or dinner, yeah? You clearly mean far more to me than I mean to you. I think that's No, right. no, not true. I'm not, I'm not having that, not having that at all. You mean, you mean the world to me. And for heaven's sake, look, I've got, I'm gonna start wearing the scarf constantly, okay? Constantly. Listen, I love you. Thank you for doing this. Listen, man, I'm sure you can get five minutes out of this. I'm aiming for a strong three. And, and, and to be honest, I'm worried. <laughs> I'll take strong three. I've, I've done these where they said, you know what? You've given us nothing. So we're not putting it out. So You've so given us nothing. <laughs> Listen, I think a tight one is, is really going to fly.